Welcome to our Ask the Trainer Making Vet Visits Fun webinar. Uh, this is also about making vet visits safe. So I'm Laura Mayhofer. If you've met me before, I'm glad you're here. If you haven't, hello, I'm Laura. Um, I'm a certified professional dog trainer and behavioral consultant with Canine Turbo Training. I've prepared just a small lecture, so some different slides where we can talk about different things about making vet visits fun but I really wanna be here for you. So if you have anything specific you wanna talk about, that's what this is all about. And we'll go slide by slide so you can ask questions on that particular slide, or you can save your questions for the end and ask them at the end where we'll also have time for questions. Um, and this is Janora in this photo. This is my sweet girl. She's at the vet and she's smiling because we've done quite a bit of work to make sure she's pretty comfortable there. So getting started, we really want to focus on building positive associations at the veterinary office. And this usually starts by happy visits. So bringing your dog to the vet when they aren't going to get any shots or nail trims or exams, just to build a really positive association with that location. And when I'm doing this, I'm going to be looking for any signs of stress in the dog. So if they are panting even though they're not hot, or their ears are pinned back, or they're trying to move away from the place, trying to leave, those are signs that the dog might be uncomfortable. So when I bring them for their happy visits, I'm gonna go just as far as they are comfortable, which if you have an adult dog who's nervous of the vet, that might mean you go and you hang out in the parking lot, and you have a really good time in the parking lot, and then you head home. Or you might go and hang out in the lobby and have a really good time in the lobby and then head home. My favorite thing is when we can actually schedule a happy visit with the veterinarian so that you can go into an exam room and spend some time playing and eating snacks and playing their favorite training games in the actual exam room so that our dogs have these positive experiences there. And these positive experiences are going to balance out against anything that your dog views as a negative experience. So for example, getting a shot. Uh, personally, I'm not a huge fan of getting shots. I don't really enjoy it. It feels like getting stung by a bee in my mind. But if I get my shots done somewhere where I have a lot of positive experiences, say if I really like my doctor and I've gone there a lot of different times and had really positive experiences, that one time where I get a shot, is going to be balanced out by those happy times. For our dogs, as well as for us, the negative experiences are going to be more salient or more important in their mind. So when we're doing happy vet visits, we want these to be lots of happy vet visits per visit where they have to have something done that they don't really like. That way, when we're weighing these against each other, those happy visits can add up to weigh down that scale in our favor. Now, we don't just want them to form a positive environment, uh, association with the environment. We also want to build their relationships with the staff and vet techs and veterinarians at the office. So when you schedule these happy visits, you can ask if somebody would be available just to stop in and greet the dog so that your dog is also bonding and forming a relationship with the people around them at the vet clinic. If they really like the staff and really like the vet techs and really like their vet, and they have a lot of positive experiences with them outside of the times that they might have to get poked, then in those times where they're getting a shot, they're not gonna have the stress of experiencing it from a stranger. They're gonna know their buddies here and their buddy seems like they have to do something, but it's okay because a friend is doing this. To help build these positive associations, we can also introduce them to the equipment that will be used at the vet. So there's lots of different things your vet might use. Uh, stethoscopes, otoscopes that they use to look in the ears. They have little lights that they shine in the dog's eyes. They'll use syringes with the needles. And a lot of these things are things you can actually acquire yourself. So you could purchase a stethoscope or you could purchase a um, needleless syringe that you could show to your dog and pair with something really good. 
So in this bottom image, you see these, these kitties, kitties and fish. These are showing a handling exercise where the handling predicts a piece of fish. For our cats, fish is a really good treat. For our dogs, fish can also be a really good treat, but it's a little bit stinky. So you can usually get away with things like hot dogs or boiled chicken or little bits of cheese. Um, one of my favorites for my dog is scrambled eggs, which is really tasty. Um, having the equipment predict something good. So you have a stethoscope, you show them the stethoscope and they get a treat. You show them the stethoscope, they get a treat. Your dog will start to think about the treats when they see the stethoscope. That stethoscope predicts something really good for them. They want to see that stethoscope again. Then when the vet has to do an exam and pulls out a stethoscope, your dog's going to see it and be happy to see it instead of nervous if it's the first time they've seen it. And if your dog already has a negative association with these tools, let's say they see a syringe and they know that's going to poke me. You can start really slow with these things. Having the syringe just laying on the floor when they come into a room, not even holding it, and pairing that with lots of really tasty things. Then, when you're at your actual exam, they're going to see those tools just as another training opportunity, another opportunity to get super, super tasty, delicious things. And finally, we want to get them comfortable with the handling that's going to be going on at the vet. So if your dog walks into the vet and they're super pumped, they're really happy, they're relaxed in the environment, they like the people, they want pets from everybody, and then they tense up when people start doing an examination or when somebody starts to prepare to handle them for a shot, we can prepare them for those moments by focusing on building positive associations with the actual handling that the vet will be doing. So at the vet, they need to do a lot of things like restrain the dog, or palpate the dog's throat, or palpate their stomach, or lift up their ear flap, or um, pinch the shoulder a little bit to insert a shot. And here in this photo, we have our kitty getting touched on the shoulder. This is in preparation of getting a shot done. So we start by teaching the cat that just reaching for your shoulder predicts fish a hand reaching towards you in a very specific way. And our dogs can really tell the intent behind a reach. So a hand reaching for a pet is gonna look very soft. A hand reaching for a shot is going to look a little bit more firm. So we reach and touch in this really specific way as if I'm going to touch you, not I'm gonna pet you. And then pair that with something really good. That reach predicts something tasty until your dog is really happy when you reach. As you reach and pair that with something really good, we're only gonna be reaching to an extent where the dog starts to notice it. So pairing those reaches with that food so your dog starts to create a positive association. So once your dog or cat, if you're working with a cat or any animal, you can do this with rabbits, um, I've actually been working on this with our chickens to be comfortable with me handling them. Once they're comfortable with the reach, we can start to do more intentional uh, palpating of different places or pinching the skin so that the skin lifts up as the vet techs or veterinarians are going to have to do for shots. So here you see little kitties getting pinched in the shoulder. Throughout this, you see the cat looks comfortable. So we're only gonna be working to an extent that the animal is still relaxed. So reaching out, pinching the skin, and then feeding a really tasty treat. And I'll often start by just barely gripping the skin and building up to actually reaching and pulling the skin more, like you can see me doing with my shirt. And each time that predicts something really, really good for the animal. Finally, we can pair it with that vet equipment. So if you have a needleless syringe, you could take that pinch and then show the syringe and feed a treat. I'm not going to put the syringe right there right away. I'll practice doing a little pinching and showing the syringe and feeding a treat. 
then I might stop pinching and just practice moving a syringe towards them. When they're comfortable being touched in the shoulder with the syringe and getting tasty treats, then I'll start to pair those things. Pinching the skin, approaching with the syringe, yay, good job, and feeding a treat. Okay, what questions do you have on building positive associations with the environment at the vet, the tools that we use at the vet, or the handling that your dog or cat or rabbit or chicken might experience at the vet? I'm gonna move on to the next slide. If you have a question though, feel free to jump in at any time. Now we're gonna talk about consent training. And this is my absolute favorite thing to do with animals at the vet. Consent really means that you can say yes and no to an action or activity that's going on around you. So you can choose to experience it or you can choose to not experience it. And with veterinary behaviors, there's a lot of things that we can do with consent from the animal. Now, this kind of training actually started in exotic animals in zoos. Because if you have a large cat, um, a tiger, a puma, or if you have a really big animal, like an elephant or a rhinoceros, you're not gonna be able to force them to experience these things. A rhino is not an animal you can restrain in order to do a nail trim on. So trainers and veterinarians working in zoo situations have come up with lots of creative ways to prepare these animals to actually choose to have the husbandry or veterinary behaviors done. Now at the Creature Conservancy, our director of training, Kate Wilson, works with a mountain lion on consent training for vaccinations. So for her, she has an I'm ready behavior, which is putting her nose in contact with a target, which is like a big um, tennis ball on the end of a stick. She puts her nose on the target. That means she's ready. The vet can give the shot. If she is not ready or needs a break, all she has to do is stop making contact with that target. So her nose is touching the target. If she moves her nose off the target, she's saying, I'm, I'm not ready, hold on, I need a break. And everybody stops. This is how we avoid the animal having to use aggression to get us to stop. They know how to say, okay, do it. And they know how to say, hold on, I need a second. We do this by first teaching the animal a behavior that they can use to say, let's do it, I'm ready. And this behavior should be something that is sustained. So they keep doing that behavior. And if they stop doing that behavior, it means they need to take a break. Some of these behaviors are going to be more obvious, such as touching the target with their nose for an extended period of time. One that we often use is a chin rest where the animal rests their chin on your hand or on a leg or on a pillow. And as long as their chin is resting in that location, you can continue doing what you're doing. If they move their chin at all off that area, we stop doing what we're doing. So the animal is saying, you can do it or I need a moment without having to turn to biting or any sort of aggression. Now, when we're teaching this, we use gradual desensitization and counter conditioning. So as I was talking about creating positive associations with handling, I mentioned that I'm not just going to reach and pinch right away. I'm gonna start by just touching. With consent training, we usually start by teaching the animal that they actually have control over what we're doing. So with the animal performing the behavior, we start to add in a behavior on our own. So in this photo, you can see this sweet lab. His name's Tonka, he's awesome. But he had an ear infection and he needed to get eardrops and he did not like eardrops. And when this bottle of eardrops came out, he would run and hide in the other room. So we worked with him on consent training, teaching him that if he put his head in our chin, or I think for this boy, we might have done, if you sit and look at a treat pouch. So if you're in a specific body position, looking at a particular thing, we will move forward with what we're doing. If you look away, 
or change body position, we will stop what we're doing. And we started by having him perform that behavior while seeing the eardrop container. So the eardrop container is here. You sit and you look at the treat pouch, you get a treat. If you turn away, we move the eardrop container away. And so he learned sitting and looking at the eardrop or at the treat pouch would produce an eardrop container, but far away from him. And once he learned that, we started to move the eardrop container side to side, not actually even towards the animal yet. And the first time we did this, he looked away from the treat pouch at the eardrop container, like, what are you doing with that thing? And so we returned it to our lap and we waited for him to look back at the treat pouch. He looked at the treat pouch, we presented the eardrop container again, moved it slightly, and then fed him a treat. If you're familiar with mark and reward training, you'll know that we often use a specific sound or a flash of light or a touch to tell an animal that they've earned a treat in the moment. And here with consent training, we use this, marking at very specific times so the animal understands that it's both their behavior and our behavior that's earning them the treat. So first, we rewarded him for just sitting and looking at that treat pouch. Then, once he was very skilled at doing that, we stopped marking for looking at the treat pouch and started marking for our actions. So you sit and look at the treat pouch, we present the bottle, yes, and feed a treat. You look back at the treat pouch, we present the bottle, move it slightly, yes, and then feed a treat. If at any point he looked away from that treat pouch or stood up or laid down or changed his body position at all, we stop, put everything back down, but no treat happens. This gives him motivation to do the behavior and allow us to do our behavior because the good things are happening when he sits, looks at the treat pouch and lets us do what we're doing. In that way, we have both gradual desensitization, exposure at a level where the dog is comfortable, slowly increasing, so the bottle appears, then the bottle starts moving, then we add it in the bottle moves towards you a little bit, towards you a little bit more, towards you a little bit more, makes contact with you, makes contact for a little longer, makes contact and you get a drip. So every step of the way, he was getting really good treats. And any time he turned away from that treat pouch, we would all stop. So he was in control of the process and his actions would start our actions or stop our actions, but he was getting treats for experiencing our actions. So he wanted us to keep going so that he could keep earning those really good treats. Now, one caveat to this is if you have a dog who is very, very, very motivated by food, I start using actually a lower level treat so that the dog is not so focused on the food that they're ignoring what we're doing. We want them to see what we're doing so that they're not startled all of a sudden when we touch them. If your dog has no idea that you're even moving because they're staring at your treat pouch and salivating and their pupils are totally dilated and they're so excited about that food, the moment your hand is right there on their ear, that might be a startle moment. So I want them to be fully aware. I want them to be able to say no and realize that they can stop the process, but I don't want them to say no every time. So as we're training this, we do so with a less is more mentality. If the dog is consistently saying, whoa, whoa, I need a break. I'm moving forward too fast with my desensitization and counter conditioning. For the dog, they're experiencing this as overwhelming and they need us to stop. So I want to have lots and lots of experiences of, yeah, I'm ready, awesome, I got a treat for that. Yeah, I'm ready, awesome, I got a treat for that. And very few experiences of, whoa, whoa, okay, that's a lot. Can we take a break? We want to move at a pace where the animal is really understanding what's going on. So in the very beginning, I'm going to first really make that a strong behavior. And as I'm doing this, I'm not going to be cueing it specifically. 
So I'm not going to say, look here. If I say, look here, the behavior is not voluntary. So the animal is not saying, okay, I'm ready. When they are ready, they're doing a behavior because I cued it. I cued it and they're like, oh, okay, I'll do what you asked. What I want is for the dog to be the one that drives the training. Now, it is voluntary in the sense that we're not physically moving their head, but they are not coming to that choice on their own. So with consent training, I want the choice to be there and for them to be able to make it when they're ready. This is kind of a, a big concept if we've never used it before in training. And it can take a little bit for our dogs to understand it. But once they do, it really empowers them to use these very small behaviors to show us that they're not ready for us to keep going. I've used consent with my dog for all of her shots. I've used consent training with her to examine um, injuries. So she was spayed and she had a reaction to the sutures and we actually had to shave over the suture and peel off scab. And during that process, she was able to say, okay, I'm ready. And for her, it looks like laying down and looking at a treat pouch. I've had lots of clients use chin rest behaviors because it's very clear when the dog is in a chin rest or when they move their head off. Um, chin rests are fantastic for this. You can teach them to rest their chin on your lap instead of your hand so that you have two hands free to do this training if you're one person training. With Genora, I've always done it as a team. So one person has the treat pouch and is feeding while I am doing all of the handling or shots because for Janora, she's not comfortable with other people reaching out to her. For Tonka, his dad did this on his own. So Tonka looks at that pouch and that's a cue for him to be able to do what he needed to do to keep Tonka healthy. Consent behaviors can be used for anything that we can prepare the dog for. We've used these for vaccines, blood draws, nail trims, ear drops, eye drops, physical examinations. I use consent for separation anxiety training. I, we can use it in reactivity training. It's a concept that you can use across the board as soon as the animal knows there's a behavior that starts this and a behavior that stops this. But there are times where I don't use consent. For example, when I had to take my dog in for her spay, and she needed to be sedated. The shot for sedation is a muscle shot, which is painful. And there's nothing I can do to gradually desensitize her to the point where she would be aware that this is going to go into muscle. So for that, we did not use consent because she would not be ready or understand what she was saying yes to. She would expect if she saw a syringe, and then looked over at a treat pouch, that she was going to get a sub Q or right under the skin shot, which is much less painful. So for her spay, we had to use some different techniques, which we'll talk about in this next slide, which is about safety. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the steps we can take to prepare our dog for safe vet visits if they are uncomfortable and need something to be done to them that they are not ready for. Because sometimes, even if we've been training, there are things that need to happen that we haven't prepared our dogs for, such as this muscle shot that Janora needed for her spay. There was nothing I could do to prepare her for what that would feel like. So instead, we used safety techniques. So we worked on muzzle training teaching her to love her muzzle. And here in this photo, you can see, this is a little puppy, Quinn. She is looking up at this muzzle like it is the tastiest treat in the world. And there's not actually any food being held right now. This is just how she looks at her muzzle. She loves it. Um, the muzzle predicts all the really, really tasty things. She gets chicken out of it. She gets cheese out of it. She gets eggs through it. She gets to run around and chase it and shove her face in it like a really fun game. And by doing all those fun games and pairing the muzzle with all these great things, she loves this thing. So if the dog loves their muzzle, it's one less scary thing during a vet visit and it's going to keep everybody safe. 
For Janora's spay, she wore a muzzle for that sedation shot because she has previously shown aggression towards the vets and we needed to make sure that she could get this shot safely. So for her, it was put your face in the muzzle. She was trained to do it. She likes the muzzle. And with your face in the muzzle, we're then going to have a vet tech quickly give you a shot so you fall asleep. Muzzle training is important for all dogs, even those who haven't previously shown aggression. Because when you're at the vet, you're going to be there for a lot of different reasons. And sometimes you're going to have to go for emergency visits. So let's say your dog tears a tendon or breaks a bone. In that case, they are going to be in pain and you might have to go to an emergency vet. So it's somebody that your dog doesn't have a relationship with. That could be scary. And pain and fear are two things that trend animals towards aggression. You're much more likely to be aggressive if you're scared or hurt. So the vet is a place where a lot of dogs will show aggression, even if they never show it outside of that place. So I really like to teach every dog that a muzzle is something that they can really love. In fact, we introduce dogs to muzzles in our puppy classes as part of their socialization. This is something you might see in your life. And here you can see in this photo, this is a basket muzzle. It's dark and plastic. It looks kind of like, um, like a scary mask, but these are the most comfortable muzzles for dogs. This is a Baskerville Ultra muzzle. These are really comfortable because the dog can pant, they can eat treats, they can drink water. Um, once we teach them that the feeling of it resting on their, their nose and strapped behind their ears is actually something that predicts lots of good things for them, dogs can become really happy with these on. Now this way, if they have to be muzzled when they're scared and hurt, it's not one more stressful thing. Stress is something that's going to release a lot of hormones into the system. And there is this concept called stress stacking or trigger stacking, which can happen at the vet as well as in other situations. Now stress stacking happens when the animal experiences multiple stressors in a row, because each of those stressors is going to release these hormones into the bloodstream. And it takes time for the body to process those. During that time, if they experience another stressor, it adds more of those stress hormones. And once they reach a certain level of those stress hormones, we see over threshold reactions, such as biting, growling, um, running away and hiding. All of those are things that we'll see dogs do at the vet when their stress levels just get so high. So we're trying to avoid the muzzle being another stressor, but we also want to avoid any other stressors that your dog might experience to make the vet visits as smooth and fast as possible and as low stress. So if your dog is nervous and they have to go to the vet tomorrow and they haven't had their happy visits and they haven't been fully prepared for this, we want to do what we can to reduce the level of stress stacking they experience. One thing we can do is skip the waiting room. If your dog is stressed when they see other animals or people, or if they're frustrated when they can't go greet all the other animals and people, the waiting room is a place that can really increase stress quickly. So at a lot of vet clinics, instead of going into the waiting room, you could call and say, hey, my dog gets stressed in the waiting room, or hi, I have a reactive dog. Is it okay if we stay in our car until their exam room is available? And most vet clinics are absolutely on board with this because they don't want your dog to be stressed either. And they especially don't want their, your dog to be stressed in their waiting room. That's not fun for anyone. So by just sitting in the car and skipping that waiting room, you can reduce the numbers of stressors your dog experiences during the visit. It's also good to keep the visit really short for our dogs who are more stressed. So going in for just one thing and then heading home so that they aren't experiencing multiple stressful things during the visit. In this case, we wanna to talk to the vet about what is necessary. What do they really need right now? And what can we wait on until we've trained a little bit more? 
For Janora, when I take her to the vet, we usually only do one shot while we're there. So she gets a shot, um, it's the rabies shot that the vet needs to see happen, and then we hold off on the other shots. That way, she's set up to not stress stack while we're at the vet. So just that one thing happens, it predicts tasty treats, it was done with consent, and her stress levels are not gonna go up due to little pains that she experiences. It's also important to help our dogs out if they are generally anxious at the vet. There are different things we can do, such as having some medications on board, um, preparing them by having a really good day beforehand, setting them up to be at their lowest stress levels when they go in. Now, if your dog is nervous around people or nor nervous in different environments, calling up your vet and asking if there's some sort of pre-medication they can take before their vet visits is something that a lot of veterinarians are on board with. Many of them will recommend it if they notice your dog is super nervous during their vet visits, but it can be worth it to call ahead and just say, hey, is there something we can give to help them out for this experience since they tend to be nervous with the handling. If you need to do something at the vet and your dog is not prepared for it and your dog has shown aggression before, it can be really useful to use protected contact. So I mentioned that my dog, Janora, has shown aggression at the vet before. This happened in the very beginning when I brought her home. She's an adult and a rescue, and we don't know what happened to her in the past, but we do know that she's very uncomfortable with hands reaching towards her. And we learned that at the vet's office, because before that, she hadn't had anybody just reach out and touch her. So when we had to give her her first shot, which was a necessary thing, we used protected contact, which meant we had a gate between her and the person giving her her shot. And this was a gate the person was able to reach through and do the shot through. But if Chinora got upset, she couldn't turn around and bite them. And this was before she was totally comfortable with the muzzle. So we wanted to make sure there was something between her and the person doing the thing that was gonna be painful. Now, luckily with treats, Janora actually did not get upset about the shot, but for a lot of dogs, they would. And so that protected contact is another safety thing we can have in place so that there's not the risk that they're gonna turn around and bite the person who's giving them the shot. This took just some very quick training. I just taught Janora to move up against that gate and to have her rear end towards the gate so that somebody could quickly give her a shot right back there. And this worked very well for us, and this is used a lot for exotic animals and in zoos. They'll get their shots from behind a protected barrier. There's a lot we can do to make these more safe. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that some vets will actually use cones as their protected contact, so that the dog has a cone on, if they turn around, they can't reach the person right behind them. Whenever we're working with these animals, we're trying to reduce the amount of restraint they're experiencing because restraint can be stressful. So using our consent and our desensitization and counter conditioning can make a big difference in how they experience these things. And having that muzzle on for safety can help everybody feel more comfortable. So our stress levels aren't also having, causing our dogs to feel more stressed. All right, we're gonna move on to our next slide but feel free to ask any questions about safety precautions. There's an old saying that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of, oh, I lost my saying. <laughs> an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. With puppies, it's really good to start them out on a super positive note. I really like to set puppies up so that their first vet visits are just super fun. Having them come in for, vet, for happy visits before they come in for shots can be very beneficial, but is not always possible. So if you can, get your puppy in for a few super fun visits where they get to just play with the vet techs and have fun and get treats. If they need to get shots in their very first visits or they need dewormer in their very first visits, I like to tell them before it happens. So we don't have the startle effect of somebody just suddenly reaching out and poking you. So I'll give an indicator cue. I'll say, okay, this is gonna be sharp, or ouch, then give it. So the shot is not sudden or unexpected and have it be followed up with lots and tasty treats. 
Oftentimes, the vets will want to distract the puppy so that they're not experiencing the whole thing. So I might start with some lower value food that the puppy's eating, say, ouchie, give them the shot, and then give them a really high value treat. So before you got the shot, you didn't even know there were hot dogs in the environment. After you got the shot, hot dogs appear. The shots themselves are not super painful, especially if they're just under the skin. So a lot of puppies won't even notice them at first. But the startle effect and the cumulative effect of just getting poked and poked can start to add up for them. So I want those pokes to predict really good things for them. And I want them to have lots of happy encounters in between them. In their first few months of life, they will go to the vet a lot because they need to get a lot of booster shots. So I plan on having lots of happy visits between those shots. In our next slide, we're gonna talk about what we can do right now, since we're currently in the COVID-19 pandemic and there's not a lot of happy visits going on or non-essential visits going on. There are still a lot of things we can do for our puppies who are only going in for essential shots. But on an average month or year, the happy visits are gonna make a big difference in how the puppy experiences the world of veterinary medicine. Now, when you are going in with your puppy, it's really good to bring some really fun toys with you. So having their favorite toys, bringing a bed from home, bringing a bowl of water. So when they're there, they feel like they have everything they need. They can go get a drink whenever they want. They can go relax and lay down on their bed if they're sleepy. And they have some really fun toys to play with. You see this puppy on the top playing with a toy. And on the bottom, our little puppy who's sitting on the scale, there's a toy right to the left of them. Um, having play be part of their visits sets it up so this is a really fun experience. This is a cool place you can go to play with some new people and get lots of treats. In between the shots and the exam, there's gonna be this downtime where the vet techs are preparing their shots or, or getting ready for certain things or going to get the vet. And during that time, it can be stressful if your puppy is just being restrained or held or if they're just sitting there and they don't know what's going on. So I like to play during that time. Play is gonna really make it so that they have fun in the interim so that when the person comes back, they're gonna be in a good mood, ready for whatever's next. And then I like to use their trained behaviors to advantage. So if your puppy knows how to sit or knows how to do a hand target, you can use these to help out with the things that the vet needs to do. So in this bottom photo, you see this little puppy sitting on the scale on their own. They're not being restrained. They didn't get pulled up there. They chose to step onto that scale to follow a hand target. And then when they were asked to sit, they sat right down. None of it was scary for them. They were actually super excited to do this, as opposed to being picked up and set on this unfamiliar surface, which is a little wobbly and a little strange. If your puppy doesn't know how to sit on cue or doesn't know a hand target, you can just use a little treat to guide them up there. Feed them lots of treats for being on there. And then when you're all done, say, okay, and throw some treats for them to go find. Same thing with our adult dogs, who might not be super comfortable with the scale. Having them go on the scale by going for a hand target or guiding them on with a few treats can help reduce that fear of having to be physically moved onto the scale. Some puppies are gonna be naturally nervous in a place like this. There are different pheromones left behind from other dogs who might've been nervous, so your puppies might pick up on those. This is, smells like a scary place. So if they're scared, I wanna make sure that they have as much choice as possible. So I'll let them move around on the ground if they want to be there. If they want to be in your lap, I'll let them be in the lap. If they want to hide behind your legs, I'll let them hide behind the legs. I'll feed them lots of treats the whole time. We now know that fear is not something that can be reinforced. So it's absolutely okay to give our puppies treats or to give them love when they're nervous. And I'll make sure that they know they can move away if they want to. So if the vet comes in and our puppy hides behind our legs, I'll let them do that for as long as I can. So they don't feel like they are being forced into an interaction that they're not ready for. If the shot is not something they need right now, I'll ask if we can delay it. 
if it's something they need right now, I'll give them really, really good treats as soon as it happens so that they walk away feeling like it wasn't that bad. Our view of socialization in puppies has evolved over time. So initially we would do a lot of physical handling with them. And now we find that if they have choice, if they can choose to move away, they can run up to people instead of being handed to people, that can help reduce the stress that they experience. It's not just about exposure as much as it is about the associations they make while they're there. Finally, I wanted to talk about what we can do right now <laughs> because it's a very different experience for our dogs right now that we're in this pandemic and vet clinics are pretty much only taking essential clients. So dogs who are sick or dogs who need their rabies shot. And most vet clinics are not allowing people into the building because of the risks associated with having more humans together in the same space, breathing the same air. So as we're in this stage, the vets are doing curbside only veterinary care, most of them, where you drive up, you park in a designated spot, you call in that you're there, you wait in your car until the vet techs can come out and get your dog. They come into the clinic, they get their shots, nail trims, whatever needs to be done, blood draw, um, ultrasounds, anything that the dog is there for or the cat. And then the vet techs check you out and bring you back out. So in these moments, it can be a lot scarier for some of our dogs, a lot less fun. They're there because they're sick or they need a shot. You can't go in with them. And one of the things we've found over time is that it actually really helps to have their owner there with them or their person there with them. Although some of the dogs will behave calmer when their person is not there, studies have shown that stress is actually higher when their person isn't with them. So in this time, we want to make sure that the vet techs or assistants who have your dog are feeding them tons of good treats. So we can ask them to do so. Not all vet clinics are gonna be loose with their food. So when you drop off your dog, you can specifically say, they really like treats and I want them to have a really good time. So please feed them treats freely, not just for behaviors, but freely. If your dog really likes training, you can tell your vet tech that they know how to sit or they know how to touch your hand and they really like doing it. And if they don't mind doing those fun things with the dog, and if your dog is particular about treats, or if your vet clinic doesn't usually have treats on hand, bring a variety of their favorite treats. It might be hit or miss if the vets will take the treats in with them because of the risk of transferring um, the disease on surfaces. But most of our vets really want our dogs to have a good time. And because they will be wearing gloves, they could be able to give the dog these treats that you bring without risk of transferring the disease. So bringing lots of good treats with them and asking the vets to feed them to your dog can help make it a more positive experience for your pup. And be prepared to wait in your car. So you and your dog might have to wait for a while before the vet can come out and get them. So in that case, we wanna have something that they really like because not all dogs are used to just sitting in the car and waiting. For some of our dogs, that can be frustrating, can be stressful. So setting it up so that they have a frozen Kong that they can lick while you're sitting there or some toys they can play with helps keep them from stress stacking while you're waiting. You'll also want to tell your vet about anything your dog is uncomfortable with in advance because you won't be there in the room with them. You won't be able to say, oh, he's super uncomfortable with having his paws touched or, oh, he doesn't really like when you touch his ears. And a lot of vets now are starting to be able to recognize the signs of stress in dogs, but it is not taught in the vet programs. It is more of an elective to understand behavior and body language. I know that's changing in a lot of vet schools now, and we're starting to have a larger emphasis on behavior, but especially back 10, 20 years ago, the vets are not taught about body language and behavior. It was just not part of the curriculum. So your very best veterinarians, incredibly skilled medical technicians, 
might not know when a dog is showing subtle signs of fear. So by informing them, hey, they really don't like it when their ears are touched, that's gonna give your vet a good idea of how to avoid causing more stress in your dog than necessary. And finally, let your vet know that you're okay with them only doing what is necessary. The vets and vet techs are experiencing a lot of pressure right now to get everything done for the dog in one visit because they're trying to reduce the number of times that people come and that dogs come into the clinic. So multiple shots and nail trims are all being done at once when possible. But if your dog is nervous ever at the vet, you can let them know what causes them to be nervous and that you only want them to do what is absolutely necessary for your dog. There are lots of different ways we can trim nails at home or even have our dogs file their own nails on something like a scratch board. Um, if you've never used a scratch board, you can find a really nice tutorial video on our YouTube channel, um, Canine Turbo Training on YouTube. Um, the owner of our company and founder of Canine Turbo Training, Caitlin Thomas, made an excellent video on teaching your dog how to file their own nails. And that can be super useful right now as we can't bring our dogs into the groomers the same way. But setting it up so that they're just gonna have the necessary things and then come right back out to you in the car will help reduce the stress that is caused in this time where we can't go in with our dogs. So that they're not experiencing all of these things happening on their own and without treats. So that is actually the end of what I have prepared for you. So I'm here to answer any questions you have. <laughs> Brian mentions, and Caitlin's video is not using the peanut butter on the forehead to trim nails. Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, there is a viral video going around about um, putting a bunch of plastic around your head and smearing peanut butter on your forehead and then doing nail trims so your dog is licking the peanut butter off your forehead while you're trimming your nails, um, bare nails. Uh, that is a really risky thing to do. Um, it was a sweet thought. But the issue here is if your dog is nervous enough that you're trying to distract them with peanut butter, then it's likely that they might feel the need to bite if we do something like hit their quick or handle their paws too long. And that peanut butter being on your forehead sets it up so that if they bite, they're likely to bite your face, um, which is not great for anyone. So if you're gonna distract your dog while they're doing a nail trim, it's gonna be a lot better to give them that peanut butter on a licky mat or a Kong well away from your face and even better to train them to be really comfortable with the nail trims. And I didn't go too far into nail trims specifically, but nail trims are one that you can do with consent. And Janora does not specifically like nail trims, but she will offer me a paw and rest her paw in my hand while I trim each nail. Every time I touch the nail clippers and touch her with them, she gets a treat. And we do lots of practice just touching the nails, not actually trimming them. We'll do just a few nails at a time and set it up so that she really enjoys that. But Caitlin's video shows how you can just teach your dog to scratch on a board and file their nails down themselves, which is a lot less stressful for a lot of dogs. But yeah, thank you for bringing that up. It's, it's sad because it was such a sweet thought and idea, but the risks involved in that are super high. Okay, I hope you all find, found this useful. Um, oh, awesome. We have a question. So I'm going to go ahead. Hi, Chrissy. I'm going to allow you to talk. Hi, can you hear me? Man, hi, how are you? I'm good. So I have with my dog, I mean, the vet is, is a terrible experience for us, but overall, she has a lot of reactivity and anxiety. So I noticed the last time we went to the vet, the vet actually moved further away and she kind of has anxiety in the car. So that was probably like the worst experience we've had at the vet. She was definitely a lot more reactive than she has been previously. Okay. And I think it was, she was just kind of trigger stacked from the longer ride in the car. Yeah. So I'm wondering, I mean, it's so much like even doing like, even after COVID, even trying to do like, um, like just you know, random th that visits because she's already trigger stacked from the car ride. I'm just wondering what the best approach for her would be. Should I should should I be working with her more in the car? Yeah. Prior? 
<laughs> exactly what I would recommend. So I love that you got there yourself. I would focus on that comfort in the car first, because I think you're absolutely right. The stress stacking of being in the car sets her up so that she's at a really high stress level to begin with. And so when we get out, that fear of the car is going to be coupled with the discomfort with people, and you're going to have a higher level of reactivity. Um, right. So I would work on the car first, and I think about setting it up so that the car is something we create positive associations with. And I usually will start by just seeing the car. So just seeing the car gets you treats, but we don't actually go in it. And then we can play around the car and have a really good time around the car. And then I'll actually open that car door and we do the same thing. You just get treats for seeing it. We play all around it, but there's not gonna be treats tossed into the car yet or anything to cause the dog to move towards it. I want the dog to just form a really positive association with seeing it. Then we'll start to reward curiosity because a lot of dogs will start to be curious about why the car door is open, <laughs> what's going on in there. And so when they sniff the car, I'll say yes, and I toss a treat away from it. So they get the opportunity to get that relief and choose to re-engage. And then we'll build up to even just sticking your head in the car, taking a step into the car, jumping into the car. Um, playing around it can make a big difference in getting the dog excited enough to jump in on their own. And then once they can jump in on their own, I'll have them just practice jumping in and out if they have fun doing that. And this, of course, kind of depends on your dog's age and how they like, if they like to play and all that. Um, is your dog older or are they younger? She is going to be six, but she's very active. Like she has no limitations in that regard. And okay. then also, I guess the thought that I just had, mm -hmm. um, she has no issues getting in the car. She actually gets excited getting in the car. She used to be a runner. So when I would roll up in the car, that was the only way I could get her when she was running around is she'd jump in the car. Oh, good. Um, it almost seems like, and maybe it's not the car. Maybe it's the triggers. It's almost like once we get to a certain point where she realizes we're not just going around the neighborhood, that's when her anxiety kicks in. Oh, yeah. So it definitely could be the triggers. It could be that that change in routine is that this is just not the same route we take. Um, it could also be motion sickness. So okay. for some dogs, we start to see, you know, they're not anxious until you've been driving for a while. Um, that's been happening with Nora actually on longer drives. She loves the car. She jumps in, it's her safe space. It's where she goes to feel comfortable if we're in an environment and she sees a trigger. But if we drive around for an hour or two, she starts to get drooly and trembly. Yeah. And that recommended actually an anti-nausea medication. Um, so there's a lot of different factors it could be. On okay. the training side, what I'd recommend is practicing drives that are slightly out of your regular routine, but not very long toss some treats in the back or give her a Kong for those. So as soon as she notices you're going off your regular path, a really tasty Kong appears in the back for her. And then okay. drive home or drive to a really fun place that she likes. And build up to longer drives. So you could maybe look and see if there's any like quiet parks nearby the vet where you could drive out and go to a really fun park. And then I build up to practicing driving and parking in the parking lot of the vet's office and feeding her a ton of treats and then going home. And then we could build up to actually getting out at the vet. Okay. That sounds good. Awesome. And then if you're best willing to do happy visits, those can make a big difference by building up that relationship. So this is not just a stranger who pokes you sometimes and they actually become somebody that you know that predicts a lot of treats and good things. And of course we would want muzzle training to be on board as well, since we have- Oh yeah, she's definitely muzzle trained. Good, you're awesome. <laughs> that's really yeah, that's like my number one thing for everybody. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you for asking your question. I'm gonna go ahead and mute you then and lower your hand. Okay, so we have a couple of questions here. So what's the best way to manage reactive dogs when waiting in the parking lot and he goes nuts seeing other people and dogs in their cars? Oh, that is such a good question, Pamela. So what I would recommend doing is either we could find a way to have our dog in a covered crate. So if you have a large enough crate or if you have a large enough car that you can fit a crate in it that fits your dog, 
we could cover that crate so they're not actually seeing those dogs and people in the other cars. That would be my number one recommendation, if possible. If that's not possible, then I wanna have a lot of tasty things lower down in the car. So a Kong or a Licky Mat or tons of treats that your dog is lowering their head to eat so they're not actually up looking out those windows. If they do see a dog or person go by, I want to immediately start feeding really, really good food. So your boiled chicken, your hot dogs, your fish, your Braunschweiger, which is a liverwurst, the gross but delicious stuff that your dog doesn't usually get. And I'll feed them that the whole time a person or a dog is in sight. The other thing I'll do is make sure I'm parked as far away from those other cars and people as possible. And if possible, I might even put an empty car between me and the next car over that has dogs and people in it. So if you can park so that there's some sort of visual barrier, and that's not gonna be possible at all the vet clinics. Um, if your dog is reactive to all those things, you could also call your vet in advance and let them know that you're gonna to need to go in right away. So we're going to park somewhere else, call them up and say, hey, I'm next door. We'll come over as soon as you're ready for us, but I don't want him to see all these dogs and people. And then pull up and park when they're ready for you. Um, so follow-up question, does rewarding him with treats when going berserk reinforce that though? That is such a good question. So what we found is that that reactivity, that barking, growling, lunging at the windows, is a symptom of an emotional response. So usually fear, sometimes frustration. So in either of those cases, the dog is experiencing a negative emotion. And what we found is that you can feed the dog tons of treats when they're barking due to that negative emotion. And it's not actually likely to reinforce that barking. So the best analogy I have is of children screaming. <laughs> so let's say you have a kid and we'll use our first example is you have a kid at the grocery store and they're in the candy aisle and they want candy and they start screaming. If you give them candy, absolutely they are more likely to scream in the future. So if you have a dog who's staring at you holding food and they're barking at you and you give them the food, your dog, who loves you, they are gonna be more likely to bark next time you're holding food. But if you have a kid who, let's say you took to a clown convention for some reason, and a clown walks up to them and says, hey kid, and the kid starts screaming, if you back them up a few steps and give them candy, they're not actually gonna be more likely to scream next time they see a clown. Because that clown predicted something good for them, even though they were screaming. And age of that child does make a difference, the way they make associations. In this situation, I think about a toddler, a kid who's two or three or four years old. Um, MRI studies of dogs' brains have shown that they think a lot like human toddlers. So in this case, because that behavior is rooted in emotional response, you can feed during the barking and you're not likely to reinforce it. And I have personal experience with this because my dog is deaf and she is also reactive to humans. So when I was first having her introduced to people coming into my house, I had a setup so she could actually see them come in, which is not common for the way I actually train. Usually I'll have for human reactive dogs, they'll be out of sight when somebody first walks in. But because Janora has both separation anxiety as well as she couldn't hear that they were coming in, I wanted her to be aware of them. So she was behind a gate and on leash, a person would come in and she started out going really intense bark. And I just shoved food in her face and I fed her tons of food. And we did that a lot of times until she was calm and could actually go greet that person. Um, but what happened over time is I did in some way reinforce the bark for her. She did pair that a little bit, which is rare. I see that very rarely. But the bark changed a lot. So it went from which is a fearful alert barking to and then she'd look at me and she'd have this big smile on her face. I did it. I told them off. <laughs> um, and so the emotion had changed. 
She was now happy when she saw people. She still barked. And within just a week or two of that, I taught her, instead of that bark, look at me when you see people. Because once we have that intense emotion out of there, she's now happy when she sees them, but we have the bark, it's really easy to teach an alternate behavior in that moment. So once she had gotten happy about it, then when somebody walked in, I just cued her to look at me instead of bo wa wa which I loved, actually. I was okay with it. Um, but it is nice to have a quieter dog sometimes. But that's a really good question and one that we get a lot because we do recommend feeding even if they're barking. A lot of dogs won't take the food in that moment because their fight or flight system is engaged. And when fight, and flight, fight or flight is engaged, they're not able to digest the same way. So if you can, setting up visual barriers in those moments so that they're not experiencing all those triggers and training through all that before they go into the vet and then have to deal with the training in there. Really good question. Um, okay, and Brian mentioned that you can talk to the vet. So they were very acceptable to help the dogs. Um, <laughs> Brian has four dogs and have had great visits, just coming to the vet without appointments being scheduled, and just happy visits. That's awesome. I'm so glad your vet had you do that, um, or let you do that. Happy visits are my favorite things. If we can have lots and lots of positive experiences to weigh against the ones where they do have to get poked or prodded or um, sedated sometimes, that can be really good. All right, well, thank you so much for joining me. Um, Training at the vet is one of my favorite topics. Um, I'm actually a, a veterinary assistant at Greenfield Animal Hospital, as well as a trainer with Canine Turbo Training. So I've got some experience with what we see at the vet's office and how things are happening right now with the pandemic. And my goal is really to help get as many dogs as possible trained to feel super comfortable at the vet so that we can reduce those risks to both our dogs and the vets when they're there. And I think you're all doing a fantastic job with your dogs. Just coming here tells me that um, because you're thinking about their comfort level in these situations. Feel free to reach out and I hope I'll see you again for another one of our webinars. Have a great day.